Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay, broadcasting from Toronto. In medicine, there's a concept known as contested illnesses. These are conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome or multiple chemical sensitivities in which the very existence of the disease itself is disputed by members of the medical field, despite the fact that some patients are convinced that they are afflicted by these ailments. Andrew Lustig is a Toronto-based psychiatrist who has a long-standing interest in contested illnesses, including one called morgulons, a self-diagnosed, scientifically unsubstantiated skin condition that experts believe is a product of patients' own delusions. This interest has led Dr. Lustig down a lot of interesting internet pathways, including web forums dedicated to something called gang stalking, which he discusses in a newly published article in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Lustig describes gang stalking as, quote, a novel, persecutory belief system whereby those affected believe they are being followed, stalked, and harassed by a large number of people. The harassment is experienced as an accretion of innumerable individually benign acts, such as people clearing their throat, muttering under their breath, or giving dirty looks as they pass on the street. End quote. In some cases, I learned, people who believe they are being gang-stalked may find it suspicious that, say, a certain number of cars pass by their street on a given morning, or that a certain number of those cars are red. Over time, these people develop theories that this is all part of an elaborate scheme to drive them insane, a scheme involving dozens or even hundreds or thousands of people, even though, ironically, the very expression of this fear to friends and family causes people around them to suspect they already have lost touch with reality. In his new paper titled Linguistic Analysis of Online Communication about a Novel Persecutory Belief System, Gang Stalking, Mixed Method Study, Lustig performs a linguistic analysis of the words and phrases used by self-described gang stalking victims as they talk to one another on web forums devoted to their belief system. And this week I spoke to him about that paper about gang stalking, and about the fine line he walks as a psychiatrist when he's dealing with people who seem to most of us as plainly delusional. Here are excerpts from our conversation. One of the odd things about these so-called gang stalking believers is that the conspiracy they have in mind doesn't really seem to have any kind of fixed objective. It's not like other kinds of conspiracy theorists where it's imagined that there's some grand scheme to impose some kind of new political order or wage war in another country or suppress civil liberties. Am I right in thinking that the imagined objective of the evildoers is vague or very personal, like forcing the victim to commit suicide or present himself as crazy or something like that? It is unusual in that regard, in that you know, mostly the people experiencing this belief system Really, they're typically perplexed and they simply they can't figure out what the possible purpose of this apparently aimless harassment is. And it's oftentimes after much pondering and thinking and searching that they come to the what they see as the inevitable conclusion that the only possible motivation for this could be to make them appear mentally ill and sometimes to, to push them to kill themselves by suicide because of all this distress that they're experiencing. As I was reading your study, I had to remind myself that human beings are pattern-seeking animals, and part of this is embedded in our evolutionary psychology. Early societies, they recognized certain patterns, like when it rained, certain crops did well, or certain times of the year, certain animals presented themselves recognizing patterns among our predators is, is a way we stay alive. When you look at this gang stalking phenomenon, is it a little bit like the human instinct for seeking out patterns gone haywire? I think that's actually a great way to think about it. Just as you say, humans are incapable of not finding patterns where they are and also where, where they're not. And also, you know, just vigilance is a an adaptive trait as well. Um, being careful and kind of watching your back and alerts to to threats and dangers. You know, but sometimes that system gets kind of turned up to eleven, and people see patterns and see danger where 
other people don't agree that it exists or where it doesn't seem reasonable to believe that it exists. And this seems to be a case of that, exactly. The people who are believers in this gang-stalking conspiracism, they have an unusually self-aware attitude toward the topic of, of mental illness. Based on your analysis of their language patterns, it seems like a lot of them are aware that they present to people they know as if they seem mentally ill. By the same token, they also accuse the people who are persecuting them of having some kind of, of mental illness, of being pathological in their thinking. In, in some cases, I've noticed from your analysis, they actually think that the police, who either don't believe their stories or who are on the side of their persecutors, that the police themselves might have some kind of mental illness or, or be compromised in some way by people accusing them of things. Could you talk a little bit about this? You know, one of the things that the people affected by this seem to struggle with is to try and work out who's involved and who's not involved. You know, it's a, a kind of frightening thing to try and, and sort that out. And and it seems as though the harder they look, the more people it seems are involved and that, that in fact, it, it appears to have no boundaries. Just as, you know, it's a common phenomenon uh, for psychiatrists when they are working with people who experience psychosis to the, the psychiatrists themselves often get incorporated in the in the belief system where the, the patient comes to believe that the psychiatrist is, is in on the persecution as well. That's a kind of a similar phenomenon occurring here, where it starts out with people kind of close to them, and then the the belief system kind of like widens in in this expanding sphere that ultimately kind of swallows up their whole universe. So this is a little bit of a tangent, but as I was reading your article, it, it occurred to me how difficult it must be to be a psychiatrist, as distinct from other specialties within the medical community, when someone goes to a cancer specialist an oncologist, they typically don't suspect that the oncologist is trying to give them cancer. I mean, they may be skeptical of the mainstream treatments that cancer doctors have to offer, but I imagine that it's very rare that someone actually thinks that the oncologist himself or herself is in on some kind of conspiracy to make them sick with cancer. Uh, but when you're a psychiatrist, I'm guessing, and maybe this gang stalking phenomenon is maybe a representative sample, you're at risk of being maybe implicated in certain fears or suspicions that some kinds of psychiatry patients might have about you. It seems to me like that's maybe unique to that branch of medicine. You know, this is something that um, psychiatric trainees learn about. And, and as you as you go through your psychiatric training and become a psychiatrist, you know, you come to learn and you come to understand that psychiatric practice is, is different from other medical practice in some ways. And, you know, one of the ways is that your personality and your character in psychiatry is part of the picture and it's inextricable from the whole clinical scenario. And so, you know, this is something that you would expect if you're working with, with people who experience psychosis, that you yourself are not beyond suspicion and that you get involved sometimes or at least thought to be involved. And it's typically not not a reason, usually, you know, unless serious safety concerns emerge, it's, it's not a reason to stop working with somebody because it's really not typically not really about you, the psychiatrist. It's just about somebody kind of in your role. And if you were to, you know, leave and, and a new psychiatrist were to take over, the same thing would happen there, too. So it's kind of something that you need to you need to work with. Did you ever come across an example in these gang stalking forums of somebody who was dissuaded from this kind of conspiracism or who said, you know what, I came to this forum thinking that I was being gang stalked, but now I realize I wasn't? Typically, I think by the time people are um, involved with this community, they're, they're pretty committed to the ideas and to the beliefs. And I haven't seen it happen in the, in the online stuff that I looked at where somebody reverses their position or drops the idea that they're being gang stalked. One of the interesting things about your article and your analysis of the language used by gang stalking forum members is that there seems to be like two distinct tribes. Uh, one tribe, which I guess is more numerous, are people who are highly credulous of the gang stalking phenomenon, who feel they are victims, who support the narratives of other people who think they are victims. And then there's this other tribe of people who are very skeptical, acerbically so, and to a certain extent, act like trolls within the community and maybe mock and aggressively debunk the people who think they're being persecuted. You know, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's also cruel because a lot of these people really do have a sincere belief that they're being gang-stalked, but not too many people in the middle 
who are not a member of those two tribes. Am I getting that right? I found some examples of people who actually went to great lengths to troll some of the people in the groups. In fact, I found on on YouTube, somebody went to the trouble of like writing original songs and performing them and recording them. And these these songs are kind of making fun or making light of the situation of people who believe that they're being gang stalked. Uh, there are though some people kind of in the middle who who show up on the forums and say, do you really think this makes sense? They try to try to seem to engage in some kind of like rational reason debate um, about it. There are such people, but I would say not many of them, because I think just to, you know, to devote the time to participate in this kind of activity on either end, you have to be fairly invested in it. And, you know, somebody who's kind of neutral or doesn't care is probably directing their attention elsewhere. And now a message from Blinkist, the app that distills the essence from over 4,000 best-selling non-fiction books and brings them to you in 15-minute text and audio explainers. As part of my job at Quillette, I need to be conversant about what books my readers and listeners are talking about, in part because a lot of the authors of those books end up on this podcast. But life is busy. Blinkist lets me dive into a topic quickly and find out how to deploy my reading time best. Blinkist also has teamed up with popular podcast creators to blink those podcasts for you too. And yes, the company uses the word blink as a verb like that. It's a thing. By blinking a podcast using a feature called shortcasts, you can get to the heart of an episode quickly, complete with high quality audio. You can jump right in on the go during your commute, at the gym, around the house, or even download to listen offline. 15 million people are already using Blinkist to broaden their knowledge in 27 nonfiction categories, including self-improvement, personal growth, management, leadership, and mindfulness. And like I've told you before, the length of a typical Blinkist abridgment is just 15 minutes, about the length of time it takes me to walk my dog. Some of my recent favorites include The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator by Timothy C. Weingard, Becoming by Michelle Obama, and The AI Economy by Roger Boodle. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Quillette to start your free 7-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Quillette to get 25% off and a 7-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Quillette. And now, back to our podcast. Can I ask, how did you first get interested in this issue of gang stalking? I've had a kind of a long-standing interest in this idea, although I didn't know to call it that at the time, of um, contested psychiatric conditions or contested medical conditions. Over a decade ago, I, I became interested in this one condition, which was called um, Morgellons disease, which is kind of in a similar space where there's people that believe that they have this disease and, and the manifestations are that, that they experience multicolored filaments growing from their skin and, and they have a bunch of kind of constitutional symptoms like joint pain and fatigue and things of that nature. And typically when these people go and see physicians, now these people typically go and see dermatologists because they have skin concerns, they're often labeled as having a, a delusion or you know having a psychiatric illness and referred to psychiatrists. And similarly, they form communities online. And, and in fact, there's a, or at least there was like a, a research foundation that they'd established and made a real effort to kind of claim the, the scientific validity of this. And I found this notion really fascinating how you could have the same kind of phenomenon or the same set of experiences and have such diametrically opposed interpretations of what they mean. And so since then, I've kind of been on the lookout and kind of collecting illnesses of this sort. And then I heard people talking about this gang stalking actually from patients. And so I, I began reading about it on the internet and following some of the internet activity and the forum posts. And I thought that this would just be a really great kind of model of a contested psychiatric condition. The interplay of the internet and crowdsourcing information about health this is not a new subject. It's been around since the World Wide Web was born in the 1990s. And even before that, people in the 70s and 80s, I guess, were on listservs and Usenet, diagnosing each other's illnesses and sharing symptoms. And I think from what I understand, there has been some good effects of this. People with very real diseases, which are rare, 
they use the internet to crowdsource their information and find doctors. And I think in some cases, there have been real medical breakthroughs that have emerged from the information that these sources provide doctors. Yet in the case of something like gang stalking, I'm worried it has a negative effect because you've got all these people who are reinforcing each other's, I'm going to use the word delusion, maybe we'll talk about the definition of that word later. Is is gang stalking, is it caused essentially by the internet? Would, would this exist without the web? I mean, the way that I kind of think that it, it works, you know, is that people develop these paranoid concerns before the internet and absent the internet in their real life. But oftentimes they experience what psychiatrists have sometimes called a delusional mood. And what they mean by that is often people will have the sense before they develop outright psychosis, they'll have the sense that things are just not right and things are not as they were. And they'll notice that events appear to have a special kind of significance or a salience that they didn't seem to have before and things seem to have a meaning. And oftentimes people describe a period of, they sometimes call it perplexity, where, where they're walking around with this heightened sense of awareness and a sense that something important is going on, but they just can't can't put their finger on it. And then oftentimes, if that progresses onto a delusion, there's there's a moment that they call the, the delusional insight or a de delusional break where everything just kind of seems to come together and the puzzle pieces fit all of a sudden, and there's an explanation for what happened. So the way I see it is it's most likely that the people who are subscribing to this belief system are experiencing some of this kind of enhanced salience and meaning and mood prior to discovering gang stalking. And at that point, they're looking for a, a system of, of thought or an explanation to try to make sense of it. So I would imagine that the way that people find these forums is not is not probably by Googling gang stalking, because, you know, that's a neologism and somebody really would have no way to know that word if not for the forum. So probably people are approaching it by looking into like, you know, more general descriptions, like people are following me, what to do if you're being followed, you know, why are people being followed? And then when they happen upon this community, then then this in a way gives form to this inchoate experience. And they're like, oh yeah, this makes sense. This is what's happening. And then they kind of adhere to this system and then there's a ready-made community and some sort of answers to try and explain what's happening. My sense is that this forum or these types of forums are not making anything worse in that, you know, they're giving form to, to these concerns, but I don't think they're causing these concerns and I, I don't think they're making them worse. And these people likely would have experienced persecutory concerns and beliefs prior to the internet, but they wouldn't have had these communities to share them with. One of the interesting features of the gang stalking phenomenon compared to other conspiracist movements is that it seems, from what I can tell from your analysis, almost entirely or maybe entirely apolitical. We talk about QAnon or its left-wing equivalent. These are pathological extrapolations of mainstream left-right politics. Am I correct, based on your linguistic analysis, that this gang stalking phenomenon isn't really tied to any kind of political movement? Yeah, that's very interesting you should say that. And I'd say that's true. I didn't find much in the way of, of reference to politics or political parties or political beliefs in the forums. As you say, it's unusual in the current climate where everything is, is political. The general belief is that that everyone who's involved in this is is being corrupted in some way. People try to work out in their own minds, how is it that somebody convinced the police to participate in this activity, which is illegal? And one of the ways that they explain that is that somehow these people are being blackmailed or maybe they themselves are you know suffering from some kind of a psychiatric illness that's made them you know, vulnerable to manipulation and, and participation in this system. When I was writing my own book about conspiracy theories a decade ago, one popular motif which was drawn from the matrix, this idea of some people who take the red pill and some people who take the blue pill, some people who recognize this sinister reality we live in for what it is versus the mass of people who just live blissfully unaware of all these horrible manipulations that we're subject to by an invisible master. You know, this is a common motif in a lot of conspiracist subcultures. Is that red pill, blue pill, is that going on in the language used by gang stalking believers? There is not, I think, because, I mean, I think often where that red pill, blue pill dynamic comes into effect in, in those belief systems, I think often 
the promoters of those belief systems believe that that their system kind of affects everybody, but only certain people have their eyes open to it. Typically with, with gang stalking, the, you know, the targeted individuals, they don't believe that everybody is being gang stalked. They believe that it's a system that exists, but and that it, only a few people have been selected for this persecution. They, they often don't know why these people have been selected, and they try to work that out. But they seem to regard it as a fairly rare phenomenon, and that, like for example, most of the people don't seem to know anyone else in their real life who are being gang stalked. And so I don't think they have an expectation that other people's eyes should be open to this, because they, I think, would acknowledge that most people are not affected by it, or you know, they're on the other end of the equation. They're, they're the perpetrators, as, as most people are cast in the role of perpetrator in this system. And now a message from another podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're like me, you like to shake up your podcast repertoire every now and again. In the run-up to the U.S. election, I was listening to a lot of political stuff, but now I'm looking for something new. And there's a reason Jordan Harbinger's podcast caught my eye and was named a top podcast by Apple in 2018. It's because Harbinger, a Wall Street lawyer turned podcaster, focuses on real human beings and real human issues. Recent episodes have brought listeners issues like should a cheater get a second chance and how to protect yourself from psychopaths. And I dare you not to listen to another episode called Saying Sayonara to Sisters Swindling Sweetie. If this sounds interesting to you, look up The Jordan Harbinger Show wherever you listen to podcasts. That's H-A-R-B like Bob, I-N-G-E-R. And now back to our Quillette podcast. So as I was reading your article, it reminded me of this thing that happened to me a couple of years ago. It was late at night. I was walking in my neighborhood. I was walking on a, a commercial street very close to me. It's called the Danforth here in Toronto. And there weren't a lot of people on the road. You know, maybe you could look up and down the road and see, you know, half a dozen people. It was probably around midnight. And there was a guy on the other side of the street. We were both walking in the same direction. We, I remember we were both walking eastbound at around the same spot on the street. Him on his side, me on my side, four lanes a road separating us. And he stopped very suddenly and yelled at me. And he said, oh, I see what you're doing. You're, I think he said, you're sidewalking me. Stop sidewalking me. There's some term like that. But he used the term as if I would know what the term meant. And he was accusing me of doing it. But, you know, he wasn't aggressive in the sense of like, he wasn't going to cross the street and confront me. But he was calling me out in a very theatrical manner as if he had identified me as somebody who was part of this group of people harassing him because I happened to be at around the same east-west coordinate on the street as we were walking in parallel. Is this the kind of thing that happens? And also, I guess, is it unusual that the person would actually call someone out for gang stalking? Elsewhere in your article, I got the sense that a lot of this was passive observation, and then they would come and talk about it on the forum. Or does it ever happen that, in this case, where they actually will confront the people who they think are gang stalking them? One of the interesting things about like that exchange that you mentioned is that this kind of thing is universal. And, it, and I think everyone has had the experience at some point of, of walking around or being out and feeling like, you know, is that guy following me? Or is that person kind of staring at me? Or, are, you know, are those people laughing at me? And so, you know, one of the really interesting things about this is that is the way that it represents like a, a universal human experience. Usually we don't confront people if we have like, like a vague and kind of baseless suspicion that they're, they're bothering us. But you know, it might depend on the on the personality, like a person who was more aggressive by nature, or maybe had been drinking and was kind of a little bit disinhibited, or whatever, upset for other reasons, might be more likely to respond. And and also in the the video evidence that I've looked at, there are lots of instances of people confronting others, kind of in the way that you've described, though not in a not in a, a violent or like overtly aggressive way you know, approaching them and saying things like, do you know about psyops, which is like, you know, psychological operations. And yeah, just just as you've described, kind of calling people out. So when I read some of the details of the accounts of gang stalking believers in your article, and you're very careful to anonymize everything, I realized that this whole thing passed ethics board approval at your university. So you're, you're very careful not to out anyone as being a gang stalking believer. 
But some of the details you report, in my lay capacity as an observer, I notice they're the sort of things that I would associate with severe mental illness, such as schizophrenia. So, for instance, you know, you have some quotes, people talking about direct energy weapons and remote neural monitoring is being directed at me, chemical poisonings. One person who talks about V2K technology, which is, I think, voice-to-skull technology, the idea of, of messages being beamed directly to your brain as part of the gang-stalking conspiracy. And this, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you often associate with people who have certain variations of schizophrenia. I know that as a psychiatrist, you can't diagnose people without meeting them, and you've never met these people. But as you're reading this, is there part of your doctor's brain that's going off and saying, hey, this, it might not just be that this person is, is vested in an idea, the idea of gang stalking, but this person actually has something wrong with them in a deep psychiatric way. It's not possible to diagnose somebody just based on the phenomenology alone. And you know what we're talking about here is is phenomenology, which is like the you know the descriptions and the experiences of the behavior, but like for example, you know a diagnosis of schizophrenia requires other criteria to be met like there's there's a time duration and there's a what they call a prodrome, which is where things change in your life before the before the diagnosis is made and you have to rule out medical causes and rule out uh, medications or substances. So yeah, I would yeah certainly be cautious and not diagnose anybody in this study. But yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for delusional belief systems to go along with other experiences that psychiatrists call psychotic. And one of those are hallucinations and auditory hallucinations as well. And it seems like this, exactly this V2K, which has kind of gotten incorporated into the gang stalking lexicon and belief system seems to be like a good description of auditory hallucinations. And, and of course, you know, that's, that's a uh, frightening and confusing experience for people when they're hearing voices and hearing people talking and sounds they can't see where it's coming from. And ultimately, people sometimes think, well, it seems like it's just being broadcast directly into my head or into my skull. And how can that happen? And this notion of V2K, which is voice to skull communication, seems to provide an explanation for how that might happen. How do you react if somebody comes into your office as a doctor in a clinical capacity? How would you respond to someone like this with these symptoms? I don't know, somebody who said, uh, I was referred to you by, by my family doctor because I have this recurring problem of I'm being gang stalked and people around me say that it's my imagination and my doctor sent me here. Like in that situation, how would you deal with that kind of person? If I'm seeing somebody in a clinical capacity, we want to start with a diagnosis. And so that involves, you know, taking a history, trying to understand the history of what happened, finding out if there's some, you know, medical issue. If there's no alternative explanation and, and this person is kind of endorsing these kinds of beliefs, uh, you know, then, then the question is we want to establish whether or not it's a cause of significant distress or disability, because, you know, just having symptoms on their own doesn't constitute an illness. It's just an experience. And, you know, there are people in the world who experience delusions or delusion-like beliefs and hallucinations and are not particularly troubled by them or not troubled enough to seek treatment. Uh, but, you know, if, if somebody was, then, you know, we, we would talk about the sort of the treatment options available for, for psychosis. You have a really interesting portion of your paper where you talk about the whole idea of, like, what is a delusion? Because that term comes up often. And certainly in my mind, as I'm reading it, these people who believe in gang stalking, it does seem like a delusion. But you note that in the literature, the idea of a delusion is, is kind of ambiguous, you say delusions are defined as fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. But then you also note that there are all kinds of superstitious beliefs that resemble delusions that are just widely held as part of our society. Uh, the examples you give are astrology, tarot cards, parapsychology. If I meet people like that, I don't think, oh my God, that person's delusional. I'm going to stay away from them. I've met people who believe there's a ghost in their house and they talk about this casually. I don't think of those people as delusional, even though I guess it is a delusion. Could you talk a little bit about the slippery slope of how you define the idea of delusion? I mean, to me, this is absolutely the most fascinating thing about this work and about this notion of delusions that, you know, when, you, you, when you're learning about these things, you learn that delusions are fixed false beliefs. But, you know, more often, the harder you look, the harder it is to really say, you know, what's a delusion and what's not. And, and exactly as you say, and as I say in the paper, there are all these beliefs that people have that are 
not necessarily well founded on evidence that you can point to or or not disprovable. And some of them are the kinds of things where they're neither they're neither provable or disprovable. And the harder you look, the more of these kinds of things you find. It's interesting, you know, to what degree really the the, the notion of delusion is socially constructed and and more or less, you know, if your psychiatrist says that you have a delusion, then you have a delusion, but that it's it's really not possible to kind of nail down exactly or certainly what that even is. This episode of the Quillette Podcast is brought to you by Magic Spoon Cereal. A serving of Magic Spoon comes with zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net carb grams. It's only 140 calories per serving, or about 15 minutes on the Peloton. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free, and it's now available in Canada. In the past, I've told you about how much I enjoy cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry flavors. Since then, Magic Spoon has added cinnamon and peanut butter flavors. And now there's two new ones, cookies and cream and maple waffle. And as someone who likes to experiment in the kitchen, I can attest that these flavors often mix well. So for instance, you could combine maple waffle with one of your favorite fruit flavors to simulate a fancy breakfast platter at IHOP. Go to magicspoon.com slash quillette, that's with two L's and two T's, to grab the new limited edition cookies and cream, maple waffle, or a custom bundle of cereal to try today. And be sure to use our promo code QUILLETTE at checkout to save $5. This offer is now good anywhere in the US or Canada, but only when you use our code at checkout. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash quillette and use the code quillette to save $5. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Your paper came out a few weeks ago. I'm wondering if there are people who have mentioned it in any of these web forums that you've monitored and, and if maybe you have become seen as a mouthpiece for the persecutors or whatnot, because I'm, I'm guessing that may have been one of your worries when you wrote the paper. I've checked and no, it, it hasn't. And th- there is some other published work on this phenomenon as well. And I've, I've not ever seen any work in the scientific literature um, alluded to or cited on these forums for whatever reason. You know, I did though take pains to be respectful of, of the people who contribute to the forums and not to make a diagnosis or really take a stance with re- with respect to the you know credibility of the claims, but more just looking at like the way that the the belief system is constructed. So my hope would be that you know even if this paper does surface in those forums, that that it would be seen as being like a a fair and kind of nonpartisan description of their experiences. Andrew Lustig is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Along with co-authors Gavin Brooks and Daniel Hunt, he's the author of Linguistic Analysis of Online Communication about a Novel Persecutory Belief System, Gang Stalking, Mixed Methods Study, published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Dr. Lustig, thanks so much for being on the Colette Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 